Amen. Good morning. Let's stand, please, for the call to worship. Welcome to Burns Memorial United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to have you all here this first Sunday of Advent. It's exciting to be here with this changing of the season. And we begin to sing our Christmas carols, the best music all year at this time of year. Uh, the call to worship is printed in the bulletin. The words are from Psalm 51. I'll read the light print if you all read the dark print. O oh Lord, open my lips. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name praise. Amen. And let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we gather here this morning to indeed praise your name and exalt your name and worship you together. Lord, we know that our blessings come from you and we all have so many blessings and we're especially grateful during this Thanksgiving week, grateful for the blessings of family and, and food and fellowship and grateful most of all for your love which gives meaning to life. We know of your promise that where two or three gather in your name, there you are. And so we anticipate your heavenly presence, your Holy Spirit with us this morning. In your name we pray and gather. Amen. Well, and let us share in the hymn, Come, the long-expected Jesus. As you remain standing, we ask that you share with us and join in on the affirmation of faith. It is to be attitudes. I will read the light print and you read the dark. Blessed are the pure in spirit. Blessed are those who moan. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed that eat the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Before taking your seats, if you reach across the aisle and smile and shake or greet two or three people, somebody you haven't spoken to yet today.
Good morning again. We'd like to take this time to share with you some of the bullet end of a bulletin and some of the events that will be going on. Uh, first of all, if you notice inside your bulletin, you have two inserts. One is for the angel tree, which we have to have a right, which is sponsored by the fellowship class. And on there, we have two areas of recognition. You have in honor of or in memory of. Each entry is $2 each, and we ask that you please support the Fellowship Missionary Program. And uh, the last day for doing this is the 12th of December, so we ask that you fill that out. We also, you know, we just finished Thanksgiving, but now we're moving into turkey time again for Christmas, and we have the red insert, which is for the United Methodist Man. And we have uh, the last day to order turkey or ham is Sunday, December the 12th. And uh, the prices are the same. The hams, uh, 100, oh Lord. <laughs> I was messing with you. Uh, I'll say 100 so you know that it's not that. It's $50 for the ham and 45 for the turkeys. If you enjoy the ones we have for Thanksgiving, uh, and I really did, I had a ham, and it's really, it's really nice. We ask that you fill this out and also, and the last date for that uh, will be uh, on December the 12th. And we ask that you please uh, govern yourself accordingly. Uh, inside the bulletin, you'll see that on Monday, again, we're gonna have the Monday movers who will come over and walk. And Monday evening, the United Methodist men will meet at 7 p.m. So we ask that you please be there for that. Uh, we moved it up uh, for that day. Uh, so that you will enjoy that and we want you to come out. All men are invited, okay? Not necessarily because you uh, think you have to be in a special group. Any man, any man that is here, you may come out and spend that time with us and that's Monday evening at 7 p.m. Uh, we have Bible studies, you know, on Wednesday morning at 10 and by Zoom in the afternoon on Wednesday afternoon, uh, which is at 6 p.m. So we ask that you uh, govern yourself accordingly there. There are some other announcements that we would like to share with you, which we have on the outside of the bulletin. The very thing at the top, we have Toys for Tots. Okay, December the 14th is the last day for you to uh, bring toys in. We have the box out in the foyer out there for you to bring them in, uh, toys that you bring in for those, because they'll turn them in on the 15th of December. Uh, also, uh, we have, uh, this time of the year, we always do a love offering for our staff, so we ask that you please keep them in mind. They work for us all year, and we like to give them something during the holiday season. Uh, the envelopes, if you put on the envelope for staff love or for love offering, then we will know that it goes to the staff for that day. And uh, the last, uh, the late for December the 12th, because on the 19th, we would like to present them with the gift. These gifts are divided among all the, the uh, staff uh, so that everybody will get something. So please keep them in mind as you do that. There's also a thank you note in here for those that worked on the individuals last week for after we had the lunch at the church last Sunday, we came over and decorated the church. And they have certain names in there uh, down we got thank you to the many hands who helped decorate the sanctuary last week. We got Brenda, Linda, Doris, Travis, Nita, Mary, Estelle, Sheila, Jordan, uh, Diane, Tom, Nita, uh, Laura, John, and Bill Williams. They forgot to put his name up there. But he was here too. <laughs> he was here too, so. <laughs> okay, and then we got family night dinner. We're gonna do it this time on the 15th of December. It's going to be a breakfast for, uh, for dinner that day, and uh, that will be on the 15th again. Please fill out the little card. You can cut that out and put it in the plate, so that, put it in the uh, little basket over there, or give it to someone, or leave it at the uh, office, or call the office, or whatever. So please come out. That's going to be the last meal for the year, so we ask that you come out. And it's going to be a breakfast meal, so... 
Come on out and enjoy that time with us, okay? Uh, and that is it. So God is good and all the time. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Nobody does that the way you do it, Bill. I appreciate it. Yeah, I had inadvertently left Bill's name off the, the decorating list. Mavis saw that and said, where'd you go last Sunday afternoon, Bill? So I'm glad we, glad we clarified. Bill was here working hard. Uh, we're going to light our Advent candle in just a moment. We have a designated acolyte for our season. Lila, if you could come on up and, and light our candle. Good to have the rays back with us. This is, as you know, the beginning of a church season called Advent. You can go ahead and light up here if you would. Uh, there's a responsive reading in the program. I'll read the light print in just a moment. Uh, and if you would all read the dark print together. Uh, Advent, Advent season is, uh, you got it lit there? One second, let me talk for just a second. Advent season, Advent is a Latin, is from a Latin word adventus. It means the arrival of a personal or personage of some importance. And this is the season that anticipates the birth of Jesus Christ. And we mark this with the four Sundays. You see the four candles there. Just like before Easter, we have a Lent season. Before Advent, before Christmas, there's the Advent season. And the, the church history reason for that is they used to do a lot of baptisms and joining the church both at Christmas time and at Easter. And so you had this four weeks of, of preparation. So just a, a, a note that if you haven't joined the church or if you haven't been baptized, traditionally Christmas is a good time to do that. And just talk to me about it. We'll be happy to make that part of the service. If you would, let's read the, the Advent reading for the first Sunday of Advent. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. Shine in darkness to show us the way of salvation. Amen. Go ahead, Lila. Amen. Thank you. I love the uh, Advent wreath as a visual reminder as we count down the four Sundays and then the Christ candle in the middle on Christmas Eve, which is always one of the best services all year long. Christmas Eve this year on a Friday night. We're going to continue our worship uh, with singing together, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and we'll sing uh, three verses. The words are on the screen. You can remain seated as we sing together. Before we go to the Lord in prayer together, I have a couple of prayer concerns to share. We are praying. You might have seen pictures that Deb Welsh put on, on Facebook. 
Thursday at Thanksgiving she fell and then the next day she fell again and now she's recovering in the hospital. But we want to pray for Deb. I think she broke her arm on the second fall. But uh, we want to continue to pray for her. Jack Vickery also took a fall and uh, we want to remember him in our prayers. He, he uh, caused some back uh, problems. And Lib is still recovering from a hip surgery. And I know we have others in our community that are hurting. Here we are at Christmas time, a time of celebration, yet, yet many of our friends are in pain and, and struggling. We also want to recognize uh, the Moore family and pray for them. Tommy Moore, Sue's brother, passed away on Thanksgiving Day. And so let's remember uh, the Moore family, especially Sue, uh, as she processes the grief and, and comes to terms with the loss while celebrating the life yet missing a dear brother. Well, let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Lord, we know that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. You are the one who came to show us the way and to bring hope to our lives. Dear Lord, as we celebrate again your coming into this world in a few weeks, Lord, we, we, we are mindful that, that we can't wait, but that we need you right now. We need you in our life, in our grief and our struggles and our need for healing and our need to have hope renewed. Oh, Emmanuel, come unto us and renew our hope even now. Help us to know once more that, that in you is life, not just now, but eternal life. Oh, Emmanuel, come and, and reach out and touch those of our community that need healing. Touch hearts and minds and souls and bodies and Touch as you did so long ago in Galilee and, and Samaria and Jerusalem. Touch us even now with your healing hand. Oh, Emmanuel, who, who died to give us life, we pray that even now we might have your life renewed within us, that once again you might pour your spirit upon us, that as we sing this season of Christmas carols, as we sing of joy, that it might be renewed joy in our hearts renewed celebration for your great love, for the amazing incarnation, for the depth of change that you went through to come into our world to be the Christ for us. Lord, we are so thankful that you are our Emmanuel. Gracious Lord, we lift up together our nation and the leaders of the world. We pray that you give wisdom. We pray that you give direction. We pray especially for your people who are in parts of the world where they're persecuted, that you would be with them in the midst of the struggle. And Lord, we, we lift up in silence those of our community who we haven't named aloud, but who we name in our hearts, who need your love and care today. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. And now with the confidence of children of God, let's pray together as Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
wonderful to have Joey Hilliard singing with us again. I hope this is uh, an every week thing going on. Dottie and, and Zoe in the back, you can hear your husband and, and granddaddy singing up front here again every week. So it'll be wonderful. Our scripture today is from Luke chapter 21. I've just got a couple verses listed in the program, but, but really he's talking about a little more than that. So I'm going to read the, uh, from verse 5 uh, selections all the way down through uh, verse 36. Let's stand, please, for the reading of God's word. Some of Jesus' disciples began, hang on, I want to put a slide up. We'll start again. Some of Jesus' disciples began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. But Jesus said, the time is coming when all these things will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Teacher, they said, when will all this happen? What sign will show us that these things are about to take place? Jesus replied, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and saying the time has come, but don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Then he added, nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and there will be famines and plagues in many lands, and there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You, you will be dragged into synagogues and prisons. You will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you, for I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, will betray you. They, they will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you are my followers, but not a hair of your head will perish. But by standing firm, you will win your souls. And there will be many strange signs in the sun and moon and stars. And here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides, People will be terrified by what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud with power and great glory. So when all these things begin to happen, stand and look up, for your salvation is near. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Don't let that day catch you unaware, like a trap. For the day will come upon everyone living on the earth. Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape through these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> so here we are in the beginning of the Advent season. And we are beginning to anticipate the birth of Jesus, and our decorating committee did a great job. Our ad hoc decorators came in, and, and we're all thinking about the birth of the baby Jesus. And all of a sudden, you have this reading that isn't having anything to do with the birth of the baby Jesus. That's because the first Sunday of Advent, the theme isn't on the first Advent, the first arrival, but on the second Advent, the second coming. And let me tell you, when you talk about the second coming, people tend to go to extremes. For some people, it becomes the whole focus of their faith. For some people, when you begin to talk about the second coming, it becomes the whole focus of their faith as if it's the most important part of being a Christian. When I was in, in high school, it was the talk of the land. I went to high school in the 1970s. The 1970s, the number one bestseller, bestseller of nonfiction books was a book by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth. Over 9 million copies sold the first year, and, and it was even uh, adapted to a TV documentary with, no, with none other than Orson Welles. You remember Orson Welles reading the, uh, reading the script? In total, 38 million copies were sold, and this is when the population of the United States was just over 200 million, so 
about 20%, about one in five people had a copy of that little book. And, and you say, well, who cares, John? What difference does it make? Well, Lindsay's book was about the end times. It's about the return of Jesus. It's about uh, uh, detailed predictions of when Jesus would come back and, and why he would be coming back soon. Anybody read uh, Hal Lindsey's book back in the day in the 1970s and 80s? He wrote several books after that. Let me tell you, high school is hard enough without thinking the world's about to come to an end. But, uh, but such it was. Looking back on it, it's, it's easy to see how crazy we all were, but it made sense at the time. He made a, a, a strong case. I think believing in the imminent return of Jesus had some negative effects. I had some friends who put off going to college. Why go to school? The Lord's about to return. And, and some people said they didn't want to pay bills. <laughs> Why pay bills? You know, he's going to wipe away every debt. Uh, some folks, the most negative effect, I think, was that after it didn't happen, after Jesus didn't return in 80 or 84 or 88 or any of the other predicted times, a lot of people gave up, gave up not just on that part of Christian theology, but gave up on, on going to church at all, on organized faith, on, on church. Uh, so some people see the second coming as the most important part of the Bible. And other folks, and we all know people like this, uh, don't like to talk about the second coming at all. Maybe it's a reaction to the first group. I don't know. But they act as if it's pie in the sky, as if it's never going to as if it's been 2,000 years. If he was going to return, he might have come back by now. And I've heard people talk like that. And, and uh, you hear their point. But, you know, the apostle Peter predicted that, that, that point. And he said... He said, you must not forget this one thing, dear friends, in Peter's epistle. He says, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everybody to have time to repent. A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. So it's only been two days in God's in God's time, probably by the end of the third day at least, we'll see the return of Jesus. So some are consumed by end time. Some people want to ignore it. I think the thing to do, the right course, is to take the middle road, to treat it as an important subject because Jesus treats it as an important subject. Not the only thing that Jesus teaches, but he does emphasize it. He spends a whole chapter, chapter 22 on it in the Gospel of Luke. And there are only 24 chapters, so 1 24th of this book is on teachings of the end times. And you see the same thing as this chapter is echoed in, in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, almost verbatim, almost word for word. You have the same kinds of uh, predictions. The Gospel writers don't want us to miss this. This is important. Not only in this passage where he's asked about the end times, but Jesus alludes to it in, in a number of his parables. For instance, he tells a parable about uh, how wheat is growing and how somebody planted weeds among the wheat and the harvester said, should we take out the weeds and, and leave the wheat? And he says, no, if you take out the weeds, you'll damage the wheat. Let them both, both grow until harvest. And at harvest time, uh, they'll be divided. And his disciples ask him about it, and he says the harvest is the end of the age, and, and humanity will be divided. He has a similar parable about a uh, net catching fish, and the fish being separated at the end of the age in Judgment Day. And he tells stories about uh, ten virgins waiting on the groom to come, and five are ready and five aren't. And the ones who are ready are taken, and the ones who aren't are left behind. He tells a story about talents being given and the master coming back to check on the ones to see what they had done. And the ones who had taken their talents and used them for his glory, for, to use them in productive ways, he said, well done, my good and faithful servants. You've been faithful with a little. I'm going to put you in charge of much. Enter into the joy of the kingdom. That's a, that's a kingdom story. That's the second coming. That's about uh, 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 judgment. He tells a story about the least of these, about humanity being gathered before Jesus and being divided, like a shepherd divide the sheep from the goats. And, and, of course, they're asked about how did they care for those who were hungry and thirsty and naked and, and, and homeless or in prison or sick. Did you visit? Did you clothe? Were you compassionate? 
and he divides them. The goats say, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or homeless or, or, in, or in prison and sick and not visit? When did we not uh, have compassion on you? And you remember Jesus' response, when you had not compassion to the least of these, you had not compassion to me. That's an end time story. In the Gospel of John, it comes off a little different. Instead of these kinds of parables, and John doesn't have parables, uh, Jesus, uh, John records Jesus communicating a little differently. He says simply, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. You remember the passage. If it were not so, I would have, I would have told you so. But I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will... Come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That's the second coming passage. By the way, prepare a place is first used in the Bible where David is in Jerusalem and he's cleared a ground for the uh, bringing of the tabernacle into Jerusalem. He's cleared an area for the tabernacle and has it all prepared. And then the tabernacle is brought in. And that's the same kind of sense that Jesus is preparing a place for his people. He's going to bring us home to him. The angels speak of the second coming and the ascension of Jesus in Acts chapter 1. The angels talk about it. Jesus ascends into heaven and the angels say to the disciples who are standing there looking up into the sky as Jesus has, has ascended into the clouds. The angels say, man of Galilee, why do you stand there gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you up into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He will come back in like manner. That's why people think that the return of Christ will happen right there at Bethany, the same place that he ascended from. This expectation also runs through the rest of the New Testament and James and Peter and Paul and, and the gospel or the John in the, Re in, in the book of Revelation. James says, for instance, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. As the farmer waits for the precious produce from the soil, be patient about it. The, uh, uh, Paul writes the church in, in Thessalonica and says, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, in the voice of the archangel with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. That's the rapture passage, by the way, that, that the trumpet will blast and God's people will be caught up. And again, in the last chapter, in the last words of the Bible, John records, behold, records Jesus saying, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render every man according to what he has done. Come, Lord Jesus. The second coming is important in the Bible. And if the words of the Bible matter to you as they do me, then this is an important subject. That Jesus has unfinished business and that, that someday in the Lord's time, he will come again. Amen? Amen. By the way, this has always been a part of church doctrine. And so the, the middle part of the Apostles' Creed written around the year 400 has, He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and will then come again to judge. And we used to say quick, but it means living. Come again to judge the living and the dead. That's part of the Apostles' Creed. And in our communion ritual, another ancient ritual of the church, we say every month, Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Amen. Amen. Someday the Lord will return, and as Handel wrote, he shall reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. 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 So why, why is this such a big deal? Why is this such a, so much a part of Jesus' teaching? And why is it echoed through the rest of the New Testament? Why is it remembered by the church? Well, I think there are at least four reasons. I, I think Jesus is telling us that God has a plan. Amen? There's a plan. Despite earthquakes, there's a plan. Despite wars, there's a plan. Despite kingdoms rising and falling, there's still a plan. 
Despite plagues, COVID-19, Delta variant, Omicron variant that just came out, despite this, God still has a plan, despite persecution, arrest, even sometimes martyrdom of his people. God has a plan. I, I like to put a, put a hyphen in the word history and add an S, and so history becomes his story, history. And, and the sense is that, 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 that God's hand is on human history, and I think God is willing to allow mayhem to happen, and mayhem to continue, to continue to roll on and on, uh, providing some guidance here and there, but, but allowing humanity to do what humanity does. But finally, in God's time, in God's plan, God will intervene, and in the end, his will will be done. And related to this is the second point. First, that God has a plan. Secondly, that we should trust the plan instead of worrying. Somebody came, talked to me this morning and said, you know, John, our biggest, our biggest problem today is fear. Fear. Everybody is afraid of everything. Did you notice that this passage tells us not to panic? Verse 9, and when you hear of wars and insurrections, don't panic. Trust God regardless of the chaos in the world. I don't think that violence or plagues, even COVID-19 or earthquakes or wars are our greatest threat. I think, friends, that our greatest threat to who we are is fear. That fear drives us to stop trusting God. Fear causes us to focus on the problems and the chaos instead of our God who is bigger than the problems and the chaos. Uh, fear causes us to forget about who we are and our unique character, to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. I think, friends, in all honesty, a lot of the shootings and a lot of the violence that we experience is fear-driven. Fear, because violence is a response to fear. Not all violence, but a lot of violence is a response, is a fearful response. Friends, we... We do not need to be afraid. Amen. There's a thousand-year-old monastic saying. The, the abbot would call out words, tell the timid to take heart. And then the monks would respond, the Lord our God will come. So the abbot would say, tell the timid to take heart. And everybody would respond, the Lord our God will come. Let's try that. Tell the timid to take heart. The Lord our God will come. Let's do that again. Tell the timid to take heart. The Lord, our God, will come in his time, friends, in his time. I think Jesus is speaking of his return in the last days to remind us that he's the Lord of history. And because we can trust that he will in time bring all things to a good end, we can stand in the meantime, stand together with courage and compassion and treat all persons with the love of God. With confidence in God, we can keep on, keep on keeping on and continue following Jesus while we wait for his return. So first off, God has a plan. Second, we should trust the plan. Third, we should do our part in the plan. We should live out our part of the plan. You know, there's a tendency to want to fort up, to want to hide out, to want to find shelter in the storm. And it makes sense and sometimes it's appropriate but did you notice how Jesus sees the future? He sees the church being involved in the chaos. They're going to get, some of us are going to get arrested, and this will be a, a provide an opportunity for us to bear witness to Jesus and his love. Friends, you can't be a peacemaker if you're hiding in your room. But to be a peacemaker, to be a, we're called to be peacemakers, we have to get out involved in the world. Jesus said, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Last March, there was a military coup in Myanmar. It used to be called Burma until the 80s, I think. A coup in Myanmar where the military took over. And there were understandably protests as martial law was imposed. And a bunch of the protesters got killed and a bunch of other people as the military took over. But the protesters especially. And then in order to stop this, some Christians got involved. There's a Christian presence in Myanmar. My more. Catholic priests and monks and nuns, instead of hiding, instead of staying in their churches, they went out 
and to help out and help put an end to the violence. The picture there on the screen is Sister Ann Rose New Twang. Ann Rose New Twang, as she kneels in front of the police officers to ask the security forces to stop shooting, uh, stop shooting children and other people. The nuns said, when asked about it, they said, our presence as people of faith, as peacemakers, may help the military stop these attacks. That's why we're here on the street to keep them from shooting other people. In the midst of the turmoil, friends, they, they hung on to, they stayed true to their faith and bear witness to us. I think what Christianity sometimes calls us to do is to put ourselves out there, all, all, up, out there on the street and to call for peace. I, th I think God calls us to face our fears with courage. Lastly, and just to, just to recap, why does Jesus emphasize the second coming? I think because he wants us to know that, that there's a plan despite the craziness of this world. And that we ought to trust the plan. Trust that in time that, that God, that good will win and we don't have to panic. We don't have to panic. We don't have to panic. And to live out our part of the plan, which isn't running away, but being peacemakers, being involved, being children of God in the world. And the last thing I, I think that Jesus emphasizes here is that we need to stick to the plan and not be distracted. Not be distracted. He says, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and the worries of this life. Friends, I think the love of money is a trap. I read about a plant last week in Australia. It's called a sundew. It has a sl slender stem and tiny round leaves, a fringe with hair that glistens with bright drops of liquid. And it looks like fine dew. But woe to the insect that dares to, to land there on a sundew plant because the clusters of red and white and pink blossoms, they look harmless, but they're deadly. The shiny moisture on each leaf is sticky and it imprisons the bugs and then the, the plants. The vibrations of the insect will cause the plant to close in around the insect and it feeds upon it. Friends, I think wealth can be like that, isn't that a... That's an Australia plant. That's one reason not to go to Australia. They have plants like that. <laughs> wealth can be that. Not, not always, but the love of wealth can be that kind of thing. It can even change us. There was a book a while back written by James Patterson and Peter Kim, and they, they, were, they were doing statistics and asking questions and, and interviewing people. The book is called The Day America Told the Truth, and they asked a, a number of people, what they would be willing to do for $10 million. And this is about 10 years old, so today's money is probably twice that, $20 million. 25% said they'd be willing to abandon their children for this money. 23% uh, said they would be willing to be prostitutes for a week or more. 16% said they were willing to give up their American citizenship. 16% also said they're willing to leave their spouses. 10% said they would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. For this money, 7%, this is hard to believe, 7% said they'd be willing to kill a stranger. 3% said they'd be willing to put their children up for adoption. Whoa. Friends, instead of loving money, we need to find peace in God's will, whether we have a lot or have a little. Or as Dante put it, in his will is our peace. Our peace is found in simply following God's will. Trust in God's plan and live out your part of God's plan in his plan for our lives is our peace. I'm going to close the sermon with the uh, <clears throat> reading again those last verses of the book of Revelation. In fact, they're the last verses of the Bible. John says, he who testifies to these things says, he quotes the Lord saying, he who testifies these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And John says, amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. And our, our last hymn today, Bruce is, I believe, the, with his mother in Louisiana. And he usually introduces music for us. But God bless him, and I'm happy that he can be there with his mom. And 
He said he, he uh, had to go over and bring her home, bring her here for Thanksgiving, and then bring her back again. And, and he said he didn't mind the ride because he just liked to have her with him. And, and God bless him. Our last hymn is What Child Is This? Let's stand, please, as we sing it together. Thank you all so much for joining with us this morning in person and the many who are joining via the live stream. Hear now the words of the benediction. Go forth in peace. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen.